All right, so welcome to the last module in our series. Here we'll talk a bit about getting rejected from the jobs that you apply to, how to learn from that rejection, and also what to expect when you finally land that sweet, sweet job offer. Rejection can come at multiple points and in multiple forms throughout your job search. Thinking back to our previous modules, we talked about how you'll likely be rejected from most jobs, which means you'll have to increase the volume of applications you submit to improve your chances of success. You can do this by applying to multiple jobs a day, spending time to customize and tailor the resumes only for specific jobs that you're excited about or feel you're a strong match for. It's worth noting also that cover letters are not required as part of the job application. We suggest spending your time simply applying to more jobs as opposed to working on those cover letters. Although it's hard to say how long you'll stay committed to this approach, it will definitely feel like a long time and it will feel like an arduous period of time from an emotional and psychological standpoint. We know that the feeling and impact of being rejected really stings, especially the further along you move in the assessment process. Across the board, we've noticed the following to be really commonly used canned expressions for delivering the news of your rejection. You'll hear things like, you're not the right skill or experience match for the job. We won't be moving forward with your application at this time. Or you might hear, you know, unfortunately, we'll not be offering you the position or that the team has decided to go in a different direction. You might hear that we're looking for someone that's more senior or someone with more leadership experience. Or you might hear something like, we decided to move forward with a different candidate. Or you might hear things like, while we won't be extending you an offer for this role, you know, we'll go ahead and share your resume with other hiring managers to see if you can find a right fit. In all those cases, we know it hurts, but like we'll discuss further along, you have to just keep applying. When you do get rejected from a job, you can expect these to be delivered in a sandwich approach with a compliment or kind statement at the beginning, the rejection right in the middle, and another kind statement at the end. In presenting this formula of rejection used by companies to deliver the bad news, we hope you'll find a little bit of comfort in knowing how predictable they can be and maybe even find some humor in them. So you might hear something like the following. The bread. The team was really impressed by your presentation and the clarity with which you responded to our questions. That rejection meet. Unfortunately, we're looking for someone who is a little bit more senior. It can really help shape the team. Brett again, everyone spoke really highly of you and I'm sure you'll find an opportunity shortly. If you find yourself on the receiving end of the aforementioned rejection reasons, go ahead and tick them off as you receive them to show how complete your list is. Maybe you can suggest a few additional ones that we can add to the list. You might even get some personal gems like this one. Quote, you're too nice for this role. We need someone that can be mean at times. As you'll surely learn, rejection can come at multiple points in your job search. So you should always have multiple job applications in the works at the same time, even if you've already gotten a verbal job offer. If you haven't received papers to sign, keep applying to jobs. At worst, you have other job applications in the pipeline if things go poorly, and at best, you have a lever for negotiating your salary and benefits due to multiple offers on the table at the same time. A job offer followed by negotiations can really take some time, so you might find yourself in this position unexpectedly. Rejection will be the norm, at least at the beginning of your job search. Things do improve as you gain experience and have demonstrated your ability to work in the private sector, despite being oh, an academic. <laughs> the job application and consideration process is truly a crapshoot. There's so many variables at play, mm -hmm. leading to a final decision that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with you. So it includes things like individuals' opinions, impressions, knowledge, awareness, competing expectations, other candidates, sometimes internal candidates, economic projections, and even business priorities, to name a few. So really and truly, don't take rejection personally. On the other side of rejection is the exercise of engaging in learning through practice. With each job application, you will be tweaking and reflecting on your resume. With each phone screen and interview, you'll figure out how to more effectively communicate certain past experience or skills 
in a way that resonates more strongly with what the recruiters or hiring managers are looking for. You'll also quickly identify gaps in your UX lexicon experience and skill sets. Some of those gaps are a matter of simply educating yourself. Others are best stated as just that, gaps. You can explicitly call attention to those gaps as areas you want to invest in in the next stage of your professional growth. So let's say you get that FTE job offer. Oh my God, congratulations. On a more serious note, go ahead and leave a positive review for this course as it's clearly the reason you got that job offer right away. So if they do select you, they'll email you and ask to schedule time with you to talk. During that call, they'll go over the decision to hire you, some feedback about how much the team absolutely loved you. They'll talk about leveling they've given you, like entry level, mid-level, senior level. And finally, they'll discuss their salary breakdown. Considering all the aspects of your first UX research job package can be really overwhelming. In these next few slides, we'll go over in some detail what's called leveling. We'll break down the different components of your salary, including a potential hiring bonus and your annual bonus, and address some things to consider regarding your health benefits, as well as other work-related benefits. Ahead of your job offer conversation, you must have a salary in mind, and it's likely that you've already given it to the recruiter earlier in the interview process. To the best of your ability, try to do some research to learn the general salary range for the level you're shooting for as well as the salary range for the level below and the level above you. Give them a range with the bottom of the range near the average for your level and experience. You'll be expected to do this, and if you don't, you'll lose out on an anticipated negotiation. So don't be scared to negotiate your salary. At this point, the people hiring you have come so far to interview an endless string of job candidates, tirelessly ass assessing fit to arrive at you. They don't want to lose you because of your request for a 25000 bump in salary. Use this as leverage and get the salary that you want, within reason, of course. There are a few things you should be aware of when entering into job offer negotiations. Firstly, under-leveling. You will be under-leveled for your first job out of academia. We wish we could say there was something you could do to counter or prevent this, but unfortunately, with your first job you land, you may just have to accept it, at least until you have a year of experience under your belt. The reason for this is the fear most private sector jobs have about academics, that you don't know how to work well with others, that you don't know how to work at a fast pace, and that you won't be able to prioritize based on business needs. So you essentially have to work for a year at minimum to prove by way of example that you can overcome any of these shortcomings and, in fact, were under-leveled under -leveled from the onset. This might require you to move to another company so as to get that recognition and to get that paycheck. Not to diminish what likely looks like a huge amount of money to your academic eyes, but you'll still be underpaid in your first UX research role. After completing a postdoc with a generous living stipend of $50,000, a starting salary of 80,000 may seem like an insane amount of money. In comparison to a postdoc, it is, but in comparison to the US job market overall for UX researchers, that represents the lowest payment tier. In your first job, you sadly won't have too much negotiation power to drive up your salary or perks, but you will have some and you should definitely exercise it. Go to salary comparison sites we shared in module five career forums, or go ahead and consult peers in the industry, those that might be willing to share their salary info with you. Use what you can find to try to negotiate your salary. If you're asked to give an upfront range, aim for the highest salary bracket for your level, closely approaching the bracket above you. For example, they might ask what salary you're hoping for. So look online what the median salary is for UX researcher at the level being offered to you near your geographic location. Imagine your internet search shows that the median salary is 90000 with a range from seventy five to 120000 It would be within reason to tell the recruiter, my desired salary range is one hundred to 125000 They'll likely respond to the lower side of your range, maybe even below it, but it'll still be above the lower end of the existing salary range. Usually the company will add in a hiring bonus or a mid-year bonus after a trial period, or equity to be paid out as part of your total compensation package to get you into your preferred range. 
This brings us to the last aspect to bring up with the recruiter, total compensation. Total compensation can include a lot of different elements, but in summary, it's the total monetary amount that includes all the different types of payment a company might offer its employee. This can include one or more of the following. Base salary, the annual sal salary you receive from the company, usually paid out in monthly or biweekly increments. Sign-on bonus, paid within 30 days of your start date, usually as a lump sum. Equity, stock units, which are vested, taxed, and then paid out to you. Stock, vested, taxed, and then paid out to you. Bonus, percentage of your base salary, typically ranging anywhere from 10 to 30% based on your performance. The company will add these all together and present you with total compensation. One word of caution is that some of these have different payout schemes, so keep an eye out for when and how much the different components are paying out. So ask the recruiter for the annual breakdown of the offerings. For example, after the sign-on bonus is a single payout and does not recur. So your year two total compensation will not include it. Equity and stock additionally vary company to company as to how they choose to award them for vesting. Some might have equity or stock awarded in large lump sums over a four year period. Others might have them awarded on a monthly basis, again, typically over a four year period. Other things to ask your recruiter about include the following benefits a company might offer that assists in health and well being of the employee and family. They include 401k matching percentages. So this usually ranges anywhere from 2%, 4%, or 6%. Ask if the company matches to what percentage, and this will be reflecting how much you personally have invested from your P-tax salary into a 401k. Also ask about vacation days. This includes pay time off or PTO, sick days, and aggregated company holidays. Also consider healthcare costs. If the company offers a health plan, how much they cost you is a good way to gauge how much the company invests in the individual employees with their comprehensive health care plans. And finally, flexible work conditions. Do they let you work remotely or in office, or do they have accommodations where you can work some of the days in the office and some from home? Well, you did it. You made it to the end of module eight and the end of the course. <laughs> to recap this module, remember that rejection happens a lot and will likely be expressed in various forms. We know that job application process will feel incredibly long and emotionally draining, but don't worry, it's totally normal. And in the case that you get rejected again and again, try not to take it personally. There's usually many, many variables and also unknowable reasons for why you didn't get the job that honestly has nothing to do with you. And more often than not, they have really no impact or relevance to how you actually performed in the interviews. The more that you apply to jobs, the better you'll become as a candidate. As you tweak and improve your resume and better your interview and presentation skills, and in the face of many rejections and no's, the simple truth is that you just have to keep applying to more jobs, with some applications getting a bit more time and attention than others. Additionally, even though you might be exhausted, you have to always have multiple applications in the works at the same time. Unless you have an actual written job offer in your hand, just keep applying. You'll never know when, an, when a job offer will be pulled just at the last minute. And when you do finally get that full-time employee job offer, be ready to no negotiate your salary. Dig in and do some research based on your region, company, role level, and ask for the highest end of your salary bracket. It's better to start high and come down and just start than just to start too low at the beginning. And as an academic, it's likely that the company will underlevel you. So You'll just have to work for a year there and quickly get promoted or after the first year, go and get hired at another company that will start you at a higher level and with a higher pay. In this module, we also talked about the components of your total compensation, 
which include base salary, sign-on bonus, equity, and stock. Be sure to inquire with HR about how your total compensation package breaks down annually. Also, be sure to ask about the 401k matching, the percentage, your total vacation days, healthcare, and related costs, and regarding flexible working conditions. All right, that concludes our course series. You'll have a full year to revisit all of these modules as many times as you like. And please feel free to email ender at academia2x.com or dustin at academia2x.com if you have any feedback or suggestions to help improve our course materials, really aiding future academics in their pursuit of UX professions. Our final words are as follows. Persistence does pay off. We know this is a challenging process, but you just have to keep applying yourself. Do your research. Work on code switching from academic jargon to UX. Be reflexive to identify what is or is not academic speak and values so that you can effectively communicate your knowledge and expertise to hiring committees. Study and learn the job search game. You have to really be cognizant of who you're speaking with and what they're looking for. When you do land a job, the first year will be like a trial, after which you'll have demonstrated your ability to perform in the private sector and your graduate degree will only augment, not hinder, your career options. Finally, if you feel a sense of imposter syndrome, just know it's a manifestation of your own insecurities. No one else can see it. No one else can read your mind. So go out there and kick some ass.